name's Caleb, happy to be here today. Um, first thing I wanna say about the talk, the title is Webpack, How It Works. It's a dirty, dirty lie. I'm not going to explain how Webpack works because it's really, really hard to do in 15 minutes and I don't really know all the details. So, uh, But what I am gonna try to do is give a more end-to-end uh, -end view of Webpack and you know maybe not explain all the intricate details because it's very complicated, but give you an idea of what the end result is after you start with a certain, you know, project and then what the output actually is. So let's jump in. Um, a perfect example of why I'm not going to explain how Webpack works <laughs> is this. This is actually a slide from Tobias Copper's Tech Talk. He's one of the, he's either the founder of Webpack or one of the main uh, uh, contributors to Webpack. And he's explaining one of the really complicated pieces of Webpack here and how they actually manage all their dependencies and how this stuff works. So. I thought this slide was a good example of why there's no way I could explain Webpack in 15 minutes, even if I knew, but um, it is cool to see how complicated that is, and the idea behind it is all this crazy code makes life for developers easier. So I'm going to do um, some basic overview of Webpack. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because some of this is reiterating the Webpack documentation, and it's actually really good for like learning how to use Webpack, so for that I would definitely recommend reading it, but. The idea behind Webpack is it's a static module bundler for modern JavaScript applications. And this kind of arose because as the internet has gotten bigger and bigger, uh, websites have gotten bigger and bigger, JavaScript has gotten bigger and bigger. And you know, with single page applications and those sort of things, the amount of front end code has become huge. So managing that sort of massive code has become a huge pain for developers. You know, 10 years ago, whatever the date was, you would have jQuery may be imported directly and then a couple of jQuery libraries and then your JavaScript, you'd have to import them in a certain order and that was fine. But nowadays with like React and um, Vue and everything, we have a much more structured uh, code base because it's really important as developers to be able to keep that stuff organized. You have components and views and that sort of thing. But that means that we had to have some sort of system that would actually be able to take that organization from the developer point of view and convert it into something that browsers can understand. So the key idea behind Webpack is that it builds a dependency graph for your project and then will generate uh, one or more bundles. So the infographic that they have on their website, you can kind of see is multiple different kinds of static files coming into Webpack and then these sort of standard uh, static types coming out. And importing almost any type of file is a unique feature of Webpack, and the claim is that it allows for a more accurate dependency graph. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means when I kind of show you a demo. Um, just to go over a few of the key pieces of Webpack, the entry is just defined as where Webpack should start building its dependency graph. Webpack will insert its runtime code into either any entry point. But you know, simple applications will just have a single one. The default is source index.js. And same for output. That's just defining where Webpack should output the bundle. The default is dist main.js. So a configuration for Webpack can be as simple as something like this, defining an entry and an output. And you can even leave that out if you want to just leave, stick with the defaults. Uh, and this is more about Webpack 4, but this is a specific feature that uh, Webpack added in Webpack 4. And the idea is that it just provides default configuration options for development and production. Um, that sort of thing is like with mode equal to development, you get um, better browser debugging. It injects hot reloading so you can make a single change to a module. It will update that module, recompile it, inject it into the browser right there without you having to rebuild the entire thing. Um, my team is currently going through a major refactor to Webpack, which is kind of where all this started from. And we are using Grunt and some other stuff like that. And when we rebuilt our application, when you made a change, there was like this 45 second build time and then it would reload. And with Webpack, it's like half a second because it doesn't rebuild everything. It only rebuilds what it needs to in development mode. So it's really cool. And uh, in production mode, it just does the kind of things you would expect, uglification, minification, scope hoisting, everything designed to make the code as suited for production as possible. So loaders are a pretty key concept to Webpack, and that's actually the main thing I'm gonna be talking about today because this is the piece that's so core to Webpack, but it's actually really hard to understand like what it's actually doing. It seems very magic, and that's hopefully what I'm gonna clear up for you guys a little bit. But loaders essentially apply transformations to code, and they allow you to pre-process files as you import them, 
And one of the most common examples you'll see is Babel, and that's in pretty much any front-end application. It allows you to write the most cutting-edge ES6, ES7, ES whatever code, and it'll uh, transpile it back to something that you can run in IE9 if you wanted to. And so this is an example of a configuration with Babel, which is, you know, you define a test, so any file that matches that regex, you can exclude files, and you say, I want you to run that code through the Babel loader. And then you can pass it options and configurations. A more uh, complex example that you might want to look at is CSS, because this is an example of where you can run multiple loaders. So you can target the same thing here. You can say, I want to target any CSS file. And then it starts from the bottom up, and you'll run through each one of these loaders synchronously. So you can write SAS, uh, run it through the SAS loader, convert it to CSS, run it through the post CSS loader to convert any, convert any post CSS code to regular CSS, run it through the CSS loader, which doesn't do what you think it does. It does some URL imports resolving, and then finally run it through the style loader, which was the key piece to all this, because uh, it actually will inject the CSS into the DOM in style tags. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and finally, plugins are the, the last you know, main piece of Webpack, and they do everything that loaders don't do. So bundle optimization, like minification, injecting environment variables, just a bunch of random one-off stuff that's not exactly like processing certain types of code. So uh, I'm going to show you a demo now. And hopefully, uh, you can get something out of this, because this is going to be more of like running it in you know, my editor and seeing if you guys can hopefully see everything, but I clearly can't get that. OK. Yay. That's what gets the first round of applause. Okay. So uh, this is just a really basic uh, ES6 project. And the idea behind this is I'm just going to build Webpack and show you what it actually like, converts everything out to. Uh, so I'm going to start with the basic index file. This is like my base. This is, um, this is you know, index.js, and all it does is imports another, uh, ex ex or it imports two functions from a math module that just do basic sum and product. It also imports CSS, and then it just console logs the output. So um, when I actually build this, You can see it builds this main.js file. And this is actually what the output looks like. This is, this is Webpack. This is what Webpack builds. So it's kind of messy. I'm not sure why they put all these weird comments in here. So I made like a cleaned up version of it. But the key idea behind it is it has this function at the top level. And this is Webpack's runtime loader. And what it does is it passes an object full of your files to it. So here you can see this is an object passed to the function that's immediately invoked. So it's an immediately invoked function. And this key is source index, which is my first file. And this is basically the index.js file wrapped in a function. So it takes your files, it wraps them in functions, and it builds like an object with them with keys and passes that all to the Webpack runtime. So you go from having you know, ES module style imports and exports with different varying file types, and what it all actually gets converted to after all the magic that Webpack does is just functions. And that's why this can be injected to a browser, and browsers know how to deal with it because it's just basic JavaScript. So that's kind of the key idea behind, no matter if you don't understand all the intricate details of Webpack, just know that when it's done doing all of its things, it's going to give basic JavaScript or something that the browser can understand uh, in, the, in the final bundle that it outputs. So I'm not going to go into a ton of details about this, but you can see that it will define uh, each function takes some parameters. And what it does is it allows every time you call a function that is wrapped around a module, it'll allow that module to expose any of the things that it wants to, ex or that it exposes you know, in the actual code onto this global object, and then any other file can reference it. So you can see like in the source index, we call this internal webpack require, which is just a method, and we say we want to require the module math.js. When that goes up into the top function, it comes all the way back down to the bottom, and it says, okay, now call the loader function for source math mod or modules math.js, and, and it will require, it will put all the functions that math.js exposes uh, onto the exports object, and then they'll be accessible from index.js. 
So that's kind of how that works. That's just two um, modules. It gets a lot more complicated when there's a huge application going on, but you can see kind of fundamentally how that works. Um, and I have uh, in here an example of CSS as well. Uh, it's not as clean because the CSS is a little more complicated, but you can see uh, in this example I say, um, target CSS files and then run it through a SAS loader, a CSS loader, and a, a style loader. And in the index.js, I load the app uh, SCSS, and that is just a SAS file that uses a couple basic SAS things like variables and that sort of thing. So at the end of the day, what that gets built to um, is a very similar thing. And this is the, the full Webpack thing, so it has all of Webpack's crazy comments and everything. But it still has uh, a function wrapped around the CSS and keys, and then it will also inject different loaders. So the basic idea is that it will run, it'll take your CSS as a string, run it through some, you know, a SAS loader, a CSS loader, and then finally, at some point in here, it will look for, it'll take the CSS and it will inject it into a style tag in the DOM. So there's no real magic behind it. It's similar to what you could do if you wanted to, but it does it all for you. And the idea is when you have these sort of big applications, say a React application, and you have React components, and they have dependencies like images and CSS files, you can import them directly in the component and not have to worry about how all this actually gets translated to the browser, to the client. Um, and that's why they say it builds a more accurate dependency graph because you don't have to control that and manage it yourself. If you've been you know, doing web development for a while, you've probably experienced having like a massive JavaScript file or a massive CSS file that starts having outdated legacy stuff and you can't get rid of it, you can't clean it up. Whereas if you import everything you need directly in components themselves, if you get rid of a component, you can just delete that code. But then Webpack allows you to do that because it handles bundling everything for you and uh, you know injecting it into the DOM. So um, I'd highly encourage you, to, if you want to learn more about this, you can just do a Webpack build yourself and kind of pick through the code. None of it's really magical. It's mostly just annoying because of some of the comment stuff they put in there. But you can kind of walk through and start seeing nothing is um, super complicated. It's mostly just figuring out ways to essentially get stuff to the browser in the way that it expects, which is putting stuff in a script tag or putting stuff in a CSS tag or adding links or that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, the last piece I just want to say is we have, um, there's a lot more complex to topics for Webpack. Um, you know, plugins, source maps, code splitting, chunks, lazy loading. If you have a big JavaScript application and you have a lot of needs, like specialized needs for performance, like Webpack can definitely do all that for you, but it is a complex tool, so it's gonna be one of those things where you have to spend a lot of time learning it. But when you do, you do get a lot of benefits from it. Uh, and if you're using it for a small application, it still should work for you, but uh, you know, there's also tools like Rollup or whatever that will do the same thing with maybe a little bit less complexity. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.